particular acknowledgement said anywhere at the University of Toronto? Has anyone heard this? You have. I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So most of us have heard those kinds of things in various places, in uh, large meetings, in churches, in political settings. These things are said. Um, but I haven't often heard them in business settings or indeed in academic settings of conferences I've attended. I just thought I'd, I'd put it up there and ask if anybody had, and it's fairly rare. Interesting. Not, not, not the ones I've been to in, in uh, business, you know, the like strategy conferences and so. Oh, oh. There you go. Um, but I have a sense that increasingly we will see the merging of um, an awareness of indigenous issues with our work as uh, business academics. So this year we've seen a lot of, of, of um, negative feelings around Canada 150 emerging from indigenous peoples. Um, we've seen the colonialism 150 uh, logo, uh, publications. Uh, we've seen demonstrations, including the one on July 1st uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, so I just want to say I think it's brave and wonderful that the CBHA is doing what, what you're doing. Thank you. To be saying we should be considering these issues. Because good things have been happening as a result of the increasing controversies. Um, so there was a Kent Muckman uh, exhibit at um, uh, the U of T Art Museum. Anybody see that? Um, there was a lot of stuff going on in Ottawa. And uh, Simon Fraser has been developing um, a number of uh, course-based responses to Canada 150, including one that looks fairly businessy to me, resource exploitations and species extinctions, but it's really about kind of hot subsistence um, enterprise. So I'm going to wander through trying to take this positive movement, wander through three periods where we've been, um, three kind of uh, places to look. And I appreciated your, your um, remarks about studying where you could actually find data. You know, so I'm going to talk about three places we might look um, further at, at the kind of enmeshing of indigenous issues with Canadian business history and, and where this might take us. So I am an immigrant to Canada. I was raised in the United States and had a, a kind of traditional American education. Um, but my children were educated here. I'm aware that there, there have been very traditional Canadian history um, methodologies and theories, historiography, that, that the vast population of Canadians have absorbed that assumes that Canada, Canadian history is about politics and history and the military um, conquests and losses about the stories of the British, the French, and the Americans. Is that your understanding of the education you had as children or your children have had? And then recently we're hearing more about indigeneity um, and some about uh, indigenous history. And then Canadian business history almost without fail has very little to do with indigenous people. So um, it's been kind of uh, interesting to hear talks the last 
couple of days because it's not yet in our awareness of how Canadian business has evolved. We are hearing stories about HBC, Northwest Company, um, Massey's, autos, and banking. The only reason we have any awareness in the mainstream is the work of many people in the CBHA, actually. Um, I used Joe Martin's casebook when I was teaching at York, and it rattled a few feathers to even be teaching Canadian business history. Um, but it, in, with the exception of HBC, we don't see how most of our uh, Canadian business history is, in fact, integrated with in the issues related to indigeneity in Canada. Various books have sort of blasted away at these silos. The, the publication 30 years ago of the Historical Atlas of Canada um, brought Canadian and Indigenous history together in a geography. Um, the works of John Rosslyn Saul uh, is a kind of popular uh, philosopher and commentator. Uh, Brian Slattery at Osgood Hall have, have made us try to understand ourselves as Canadians in light of the contact between Europeans and indigenous peoples. Many, many years ago, Harold Innes um, tried to understand Canadian business history uh, in light of contact with indigenous peoples. And he published a, a landmark book on the fur trade that probably you had to read if you wanted to like play poker at the Canadian business history table. Is that right? Has everybody read the fur trade? Um, pardon? <laughs> Try not to. Um, so his, his theory is basically um, indigenous peoples wanted what Europeans could sell. They, they bought it using furs. Furs disappear. Uh, indigenous people get poor, too bad, so sad. Um, and uh, the beaver disappeared, and Europeans won. But he says, we have not yet realized that the Indian and his culture were fundamental to the growth of Canadian institutions. Okay, so we're, we're aware of that in his work. Is there anything else out there? Um, I showed you the old version of that. But w at the end of the chapter in which he discusses this, he says, the effects of these large central organizations characteristic of the fur trade as shown in the monopolies of New France and the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company were shown in the institutional development of Canada. So in it, for the first time, I think, in any... Uh, literature in Canada connects indigeneity, the history of Canada and its institutions, and finally, these companies. I think that's a really important kind of integration that um, he proposes. And except for a guy named Abe Rothstein, who recently deceased, who was a political economist here at U of T, very few have followed up with that kind of understanding of Canadian history. Not that we all agree with it. So I'm going to now move to three places where I think we could look to sort of bridge those three streams of Canadian history, Indigenous history, and business history. One uh, occurred to me as I was reading uh, James Laxer's biography of Tecumseh and Brock. Have you read that? Lovely book. Um, and he speaks about the importance of the Royal Proclamation of 1763. My own work uh, recently has been on the surrender of Rupert's Land by the HBC to the new government of Canada. And then... Um, I have not ever seen a history of CPR and Riel told um, from the archives of the CPR. What? 
Good luck. So um, those are the three, the three rocks under which I think we could find lots of interesting things to examine. So here's a map of what they called the Indian Reserve, which was set up by the proclamation of 1763, the Royal Proclamation. So Britain has defeated France. Um, what I learned as a child in the U.S., the French and Indian Wars were not the French against the Indians, which is what I thought as a little girl, but the French and the Indians were bad. The British were good, but then the British were bad. It was so confusing. Um, but the Indian Reserve was, was, in Laxer's view, what provoked um, rebellious uh, sentiment amongst the colonists uh, in the red part of the map. That those folks who, want, who were already settled, who wanted more land on which to build businesses, on which to expand their family's ability to make money, on which to plant more cotton, were foiled in their attempts to expand by this royal proclamation setting up the Indian Reserve. Um, and I think uh, it's not commonly told in that way. Does anybody think of 18th century history and the American Revolution in terms of the Indian, you do? Well, you're a historian, right? But, but in terms of the business, the business, yeah, so, well, why did they want expansion? It's because they had plantations. So it was a business mandate that drove them to the edge of the reserve and they wanted to go beyond. So I think we need to review um, our understanding of the um, Sturm und Drang in the late 18th century in light of, of the different kinds of economies that were already happening, the extraction of resources that could just go back to, to Britain in the north, where it says Hudson Bay Company. Um, and the need to um, settle and make money in place in the South. So there's a business history that has to be told there. Uh, here's a quote from Laxer. Uh, there's a land rush uh, as, as where people from Virginia try to take over um, Ohio and push their way out uh, into the plains. So I'm not sure that Laxer is going to be our model uh, as a Canadian business historian, but he's certainly flagged an issue for those of us that do business history. What was it, the, the difference in the American um, settlers and the, and the existing commerce north of American settlements uh, that created this uh, enormous upheaval in North America. My own research in Hudson's Bay Company and, and Rupert's Land, uh, I presented last summer uh, at the CBHA conference. I'm really interested in in the um, deed of settlement and in the Hudson's Bay Company accounting um, and how there was a bit of a slate of hand there. I think that there's an, an awful lot of uh, reframing of the notion of title and land that happens around the time uh, of the settlement of Upper Canada and uh, into Confederation that we haven't recognized. The Grand River is another example of that. Who, who has rights to use the Grand River? Um, who owns the Grand River? 
an issue there. The, but the issue for the Hudson's Bay Company was that they never said that they owned the land. They had never booked it as an asset. And suddenly we tell stories of the sale of Rupert's land to the government of Canada. So I think that there's another rock under which we find interesting things when we turn it over. Before I get to the last, the last part, um, maybe I'll do the last, the railroad at Riel. Um, so many times when we study Canadian business history, we see that the entanglement between the enormous debt load incurred by creating an east-west corridor in a geologically north-south continent, that that debt load draw, has driven much of the political decision-making in Canada. And the CPR, of course, is the center of that. Um, this summer, I had the pleasure of going to Soul Pepper and seeing the video cabaret, uh, the two episodes uh, regarding Louis Riel were presented. And the railroad and Riel are often linked in our storytelling, but we don't tell it from the p point of view of the railroad itself. And, and I think that we need to understand uh, better the role, not just of McDonald's or Riel, um, but of uh, the Hudson's Bay Company and the uh, CPR in, in these parts of our history. Because we imagine that once we have a government, it's, it's what's calling the shots. And clearly, that's, that's unnecessarily simplified. What could we learn if we went into the archives of these companies, whatever records we can still find? I've never even seen the CPR archives. Um, to determine uh, what the company itself was saying about um, the issues of the day. So I have two books that I think need to be written. This is sort of the, the pitch at the end. I think um, these books are really important in terms of where Canadian business historiography needs to go. The one on the right I read a couple of years ago, it's uh, an enormously helpful book by Philip Stern about how the corporate form was different in the 17th and 18th centuries. In the 19th century, it became much more like what we recognize now. But in the, in the uh, 17th and 18th century, it was a form of the state that could be transferred elsewhere. Um, that was kind of a portable form of the state that could interact with um, indigenous peoples in India. And, it, and Stern presents a whole different notion of what an empire is and what colonialization is that is much more mercantile. Really important rethinking of colonization and empire and what the role of, of a large multinational corporation was centuries ago. Sven Beckert has written another massive book that rethinks the relationship of state, business, um, and people in the empire of cotton. And in that book, he traces the demands for labor and for land, um, for machinery that can transform cotton into cloth, um, and the flow of profits, which drove so much um, governmental and uh, foreign policy in the UK and, and, and US S, as well as other places. It seems to me that these big books on empire 
on colonization and on um, economies are, are the kind of understanding we need to start to reach in doing Canadian business history, including a perspective of in, indigeneity, that we need to know what the role of indigenous people was in, in responding to uh, empire. Clearly, we had two very different corporate forms happening um, in the 18th century. One typified by the Hudson's Bay Company in which trade with indigenous people, maybe not as equals, but certainly trade was the beginning, the underpinning of our nation versus what was happening to the south of us, which was much more uh, family farms, family plantation based, um, that these two corporate forms could so drastically shape the, the geopolitics for the next centuries is astonishing. And I, I think that we will see important, we will reach important insights about the, the role of indigenous peoples in shaping our own uh, understanding of business. Finally, I, I want to say, if we only went to the point of confederation, we would lose a lot because um, clearly the s tension between uh, a settler economy and a, and a trade and resource economy continues. Um, and as we heard this morning around uh, the mining industry and Canadian multinationals, much of our ongoing wealth in this country is based in that that the in the mining companies we we are are lucky to host here in Toronto and on Bay Street. So it seems to me that if we see um, a future in which there's this duty to consult, in which. Uh, the Clyde River and Chippewa rulings uh, around the National Energy Board are salient, in which uh, free prior and informed consent are important legal uh, guidelines for all uh, Canadian mining companies, that we need to understand our Canadian roots uh, around the relationship of traditional Eurocentric companies and their positive roots in relationship to indigenous peoples. Are there um, ways in which we can look backwards and see our history and recognize ways forward? I think that's that's a real contribution. And we cannot do that without understanding indigeneity and uh, trade as part of our past. So those are the questions I want to be asking. Um, and, and those are some of the ways I, I um, see us answering them. Thank you.